Hello and welcome to Imp's WWE Adventures podcast on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. You can help the network out by leaving us a five-star review. You can also give a donation directly through Red Circle and become one of the amazing community by joining the Social Suplex Discord. Link is in the description. Listen to the other top-notch shows here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. One Nation Radio with Rich and James, Keeping It Strong Style, All Things Elite, Wrestling Art with Chris Things, Trish and Sarah, and Tunnel Talk. My name is Matt Mayer, aka Imp, and this is your quick look back at the WWE week that was 30 minutes, and we'll have your car all cleaned out for you, sir. Smackdown was live from Utah this week, Monday Night Raw, Anaheim, California, and then obviously NXT. In a week building up to Elimination Chamber this weekend, which I will cover next week on the show. But let's jump right into it. We know what these shows are like. No dilly dally, no beating around the bush. Uh, well, uh, just do a quick shout out to, as I am like the WWE channel a bit, and I've been at the start of these shows doing a kind of run through the past week. Instead, this week, instead of going through what's currently happening with WWE at the start here, I'm just going to recommend go and listen to Trish and Sarah's latest podcast here on the network. Highly recommend going to the, listen to that. They did a deep dive this week. They did a re- they did a really really good job. Anyway, with that said, let's jump on over to Utah. I think pretty soon that's how they talk in Utah. Yep. Let's jump on over to SmackDown, which is live from Utah. But tonight we fix it. Because tonight is about history. Tonight. Tonight is the first night that we can say The Rock is a member of the bloodline. Roman and The Rock together in the bloodline finally. Ultimate form, big boss for the end of the game. Tonight we confirm that The Rock is in the bloodline, making the faction arguably its most visually powerful before its fall. I say visually because in actuality the cracks are more apparent than ever, even though you would think that at their strongest is really what numbers-wise they've replaced Jey Uso with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. <laughs> so they should surely be at their biggest strength. An amazing heel dress code for The Rock. Like, gone is team, bring it. Here is Ricky Starks. <laughs> like a mix together of his amazing shirt from way back when and Stone Cold Steve Austin's jacket. Just put the two together in an amazing apparel for Rocky. Like, Rocky, in his promo, he really ripped into Utah, really ripped into Cody. I love the heel character work, not getting Cody's story right. <laughs> like, you think you just get another shot, that's not how this works. To which, obviously, in reality, it's because he won the Rumble. He didn't just get another shot, he had to force his way in to get another shot. He had to win the Royal Rumble. But everything in his promo like felt purposeful. Like him pointing somewhat in Roman's direction for the camera as he delivers the line about promising to make him fail. Him as in Cody, but where he's pointing... The hard for the hard camera, it looks like he's pointing directly at Roman. Rocky, Rocky was really, but the bit that made me laugh most was the stuff ripping into Utah. Like you've set a new record, a new attendance record, the all-time record for the largest gathering of t- trailer park trash the Rock has ever seen. <laughs> like finally, this is the Rocky I loved all those years ago. This is the like the, like the team Bring It Rock. Nah, there's something about the team Bring It Rock which felt like a big superstar, but wasn't that interesting a character really to get into. He was doing rock stuff. Whilst this, this is actual rock stuff <laughs> from the 90s, for better or worse. It's obviously it's a little bit like somebody who used to make all the same jokes from the 90s, coming back and making those same jokes again, and then the young kids are like, wait, what? <laughs> or whatever. Showing fr- the, the sitcom Friends to some, like uh, the teenagers from today, they're like, why are you making so many homophobic and tra- like homophobic jokes? Like, what's what's ah <laughs> uh, uh, yes, yeah, so there was the zeitgeist of its time, and it's not the zeitgeist of its time now. So when the Rock's doing the same act now, I was like, eh, it feels a little bit outdated. But what he's actually doing with his character is great, and I love all of that. A story you and your fifty wives will want to tell <laughs> your story. You want to tell your six hundred inbred children one day. <laughs> Just amazing. It's ripping into Utah. I've missed the Rock telling audience members he'll smack the herpes off their lips. <laughs> Especially when we're coming out of that PG era and we're entering a new age, which is seemingly still WWE being PG on its face, but we're getting the odd little... There's a little bit more stuff in there. Still still definitely PG. But, but you get to dance around with it a bit with a bit. You don't. It's not as strict as it was. But this that whole segment did an amazing job. Oh, the, the main thing I've not talked about is right at the end where they're all raising their fingers and the Rock... Instead of acknowledging with his finger raised, he also puts out his thumb in the shape of a 
L on his forehead. <laughs> it's just like, what are you? But um, personally, this was a really good just bringing of the two together to set us into that whatever the WrestleMania thing is going to be. They've really foreshadowed a tag team match, and this feels like a great way to get us to that point. But of course, it also seemed to signify potential cracks, and that's kind of what I mean by this should be the bloodline in their ultimate form. They should be the most dangerous they have ever been with this lineup. However, it's also very clear at the same time that a lot of it is covering over huge cracks in the stable. <laughs> the family's got massive problems, and I guess when you strain them and when you put them into the high stress situations of WrestleMania, what's going to happen to those cracks? This, for me, that set that up, this all up wonderfully. All of that, yes, you've got the hype of the Rock and Roman finally teaming up on the same side, but you've got all that other stuff just eating away at the background as well. Uh, and it felt purposeful, because I feel like if you're analysing a finger point across and the way the camera was framed as being purposely maybe possibly telling something, it's like, well, I'm also going to analyse the rest of it <laughs> of also doing that. It's all doing something or convincing you of a character trait for some reason. Big fan of this, big fan of this. Well, I look forward to watching whatever happens on night one happen. <laughs> I've got no idea what it's going to tail into, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, let's move on to the Elimination Chamber qualifiers that happened on this SmackDown show. Both qualifiers having ringside distractors on this one. At first, the men's uh, Kevin Owens defeated Dom Dom Mysterio. They loved Dom Dom in Utah. <laughs> uh, R-Truth costing his stable mate. Uh, still thinks Kevin Owens is the Miz for some reason. That's why he's helping him. And... Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it was a qualifier. <laughs> I'll give them that. It kicked off the show and it was perfectly fine. Got Kevin Owens into the lineup. Uh, the Miz versus US champion Logan Paul. 12 year olds going mad with their prime bottles as their man gets in. Paul integrating yet another Adam Page move into his offense. The women's side was Zelina Vega versus Tiffany Stratton. Oof, Stratton got Vega with that prettiest mood so ever. Great to see them immediately throw the lass onto pay per view. Really behind that. It, and in, in the matches as well, the LWO versus Legado del Fantasma rivalry caused Zelina's distraction defeat in this one. But also Naomi returning with new music. Honestly, a theme that helps make her feel like a bigger deal. She faced Elba Fire in the matches. It was mostly just there just to remind you of Naomi's offence and her character and the way that she kind of, uh, way that she rolls. Uh, the poor Scottish lass made to tap. Hilariously called a new sub. My God, she's brought a new submission with her. Nope, <laughs> doing it for you, doing it before she left WWE. <laughs> it's been for quite a while. It's a decent, it's a decent finish. I quite like it as a submission thing. We'll see what Naomi uh, gets to do under the Triple H leadership. Because obviously, we only seen her under Vince. Also, I'm a massive fan of uh, Tiffany Stratton, so great to see her getting into the uh, Elimination Chamber just right off the bat. Her work on Raw was also great character work, much needed character work. She's not had a lot of time to do a lot of it on SmackDown yet, so that was also great to see. In terms of like the little things on this show. Lol at LA Knight calling Drew an old timer. Pretty certain he's older than Drew. <laughs> also, as much as I enjoy Bait and Dunn, they're not very good at reading out a script for a promo. It's the one thing <laughs> I would definitely say that on this entire show, the one part that felt the most scripted was Bait and Dunn trying to do somewhat semi natural banter off of a script. It wasn't grand. <laughs> but to be fair, neither man's been particularly grand at that side of it. But especially like this, where they're properly scripted. Like, oh, this, no, this did, didn't work. <laughs> Here's a great example of the script being a detriment. If you've just told them to talk and get their points across, it's probably, I get a feeling that it'd be a lot stronger of a promo than what this ended up being, where they're both trying to relay a script, and neither of them are that great. <laughs> so it's amazing in the ring. I will give them that, but they're not going to get over with stuff like that. Well, they're not going to get over with me. <laughs> stuff like that. Also, Bron Breaker announced for the Smackers roster. Makes Aldis seem like a competent, busy general manager, the way that they represented it, with him coming out saying that I've I've been busy getting all this stuff, and here he is, it's Bron Breaker. And it makes Bron Baker look like a star, because the general manager, who's being made to look competent by busy trying to chase him, was chasing him, and therefore he must be a big deal, right? Because <laughs> he wanted him. A new production with The Don Is Dead continuing. There's a load from Raw, there's a load from here, um, Smackdown as well. There was a low angle, slow zoom in on the ring, like we were watching from the perspective of a few rows back, and they also didn't cut away from it. It was like a slow zoom in, and we got to soak in the shot as well. I mean, most of these things would never happen on The Don, but especially returning from an ad break with a slow zoom into a thing. 
one night more they had the cameraman walk down the entrance ramp as it went in and then it, then it even stayed on the action as the action as the, it was a, like a hot tag to get back into the action and that's when it and that's when it cut <laughs> which is which was great stuff the darkened banners with just the logo continuing to bode well for a hope for me when it comes to Elimination Chamber's paid sponsor product integration. If it's black background with their logo on it instead of the bright purple, bright green, bright Cheetos orange, whatever, everything, this is a much, much better way to do it. Uh, the Wrestlers 2K24 ratings are popping up during matches as well. This is the first time I, no- I didn't think they did it last week on Raw, but it's the first time I noticed it here. And it's a very natural way, even though you are saying the people in this match have a low rating on the video game, I'm just like, should you show Johnny Gargano's rating on on the show? <laughs> That's one of my things. It's also a very smart way to promote the video game without having Michael Cole do the ad read for it over and over and over. Instead, they're using it to somewhat naturally integrate it into the stuff that's relevant by showing the people in the matches and showing their ratings. It's like, yeah. The action replay for one of the matches also had no SmackDown graphics overlaid. Just adding for me to the nice and clean, a lot less busy flash on our screens. If I'm right, it might have just not played or whatever. I really like the way that it looks. It, it, for me, that's also that's how New Japan do it. When New Japan do a replay, they will just play it back to you in slow motion. They won't do like a big <laughs> transition into the side by side screen. Them press play on the side by side happening. It felt it just feels a lot cleaner to be able to just show it back on the replay or whatever. Especially as the whole arena's got the SmackDown colours all around it. Don't also need a massive overlay. But I think that, I think that's my personal thing is it back in the day, in the noughties especially, it would really give it this air of like a high quality production. Well because the production is a high quality everywhere else, you don't really need it. I mean when it came to one like Raw, I'm pretty certain that they didn't do it once. <laughs> they they had the lay the overlays back on again and this was might have just been a one time thing, but I watched it as like that's how New Japan do it, and I much prefer it. I much prefer the less busy screens. The shot was made even less busy by lighting the crowd with a clean light, rather than like bathing them in the show's red or blue colours. It works so much better. Uh, then they go and spoil it all by sh- showing a whacking great AR graphic. <laughs> it's like, well, baby steps. <laughs> For all I know, they've got a contract with the RA, with the Augmented Reality Graphics team, and they've got to fulfil the contract. It's obviously people that like <laughs> the graphics. I don't know who they are. I don't know who we need to bribe <laughs> to get them to stop. I don't know who needs to be set on them <laughs> to stop the graphics. <laughs> Just dawned on me as well that they're now starting every show with an exterior shot of the arena as well. Before transitioning to a couple of our competitors walking into the arena, then we get to see the arena. I think it's a really clever way to start the show, where you're you're essentially being gradually walked into the arena, then you get to watch the show. Instead of it being like immediately opening up in there or fading from black into the arena. It's like, no, no, show the outside. This is where we are. You can get all the plugs for the area too. Then transition into the people we're going to see in action as they walk into the arena, and which walks us into the arena as well. I think it's very smart. Uh, but anyway, that was SmackDown. And the reason that I spent more time with the production stuff <laughs> was made just because, apart from Roman Rocky, it was the show that was building, it was pe- getting people Elimination Chamber pay per view without a lot really happening. Not really a lot to talk about, but a lot of production notes, which is <laughs> like a huge, massive thumbs up. Uh, but, and Roman Rocky as well. That's a huge thumbs up for me. So we've got this, and then we've just got to wait a little bit, because the uh, Chamber's going to be addressing the Raw side of stuff. So there isn't really a lot for the show <laughs> coming out of this. As far as I know, they're not going to be in Australia either. So it's just kind of like, <laughs> it's got to kill, kill some time, fill some air without this really proceeding anywhere. Cody's not got a lot to do. He'll get a nice pop in Australia. He'll, uh, he'll, he'll hit the crossroads in Grayson Waller. <laughs> and hey, the segment won't go half an hour. <laughs> so, and just be building up to him hitting that crossroads. Like, oh, okay, whatever. But anyway, that is the end of Final Mix Smackdown. And with that, let's move on over to Anaheim, California. And Jay gonna go up top, top rope. Uso Flash. Whoa. Jay's gonna do it. Early bell. Gunter just doesn't have a bad match. <laughs> he just doesn't have a bad match. Uh, Gunter versus Jay Eso for the Intercontinental Championship. The forever champion Gunter being challenged by uh, the incredibly popular Jay Uso. I want to say there was one part that I really liked was Gunter just shutting Pat down with the stare. <laughs> As Pat's going crazy with the Jay Uso stuff. And then Gunter just stares at him. <laughs> and Pat's, Pat just quiets down. Like, I did like that. For 
as overly energetic as Pat can come across sometimes. Yeah, Gunter just shutting him down like that was a really nice, <laughs> like a back counterbalance to that. Also, the ending coming with uh, Jimmy Uso coming down for the interference, which was set up earlier in the show when they seemed to be jumping Cody Rhodes. Either they were sent there to attack Cody and then Jimmy went out on his own to cost Jay, or they were sent there with two reasons. But also what it does is... Actually, no, I'll talk about the match first. I'll talk about Drew... Ma- oh, I realise I'm transitioning. I completely stopped talking about Gunter vs. Jey Uso. <laughs> but yeah, Gunter Jey Uso was a great match, and it got to that point where Jey Uso is going for the splash. He's got the champion down. The momentum has swung back and forth enough. The crowd is really behind Jey Uso hitting this splash. And yep, then comes Jay to cost him the entire thing. And I'm assuming this is what set up their match for WrestleMania. Jay Uso had the champion down. It looked like he generally could win this title. There's so many patterns within a Gunter match. As we've seen them before where for like a sequence or for, for a flow, they're all really convinced that the other guy's winning only for Gunter to kick out or for something to happen. And this occasion, it was just fully costing Jimmy the match, uh, giving Gunter the win. Well, what would Gunter have won and kicked out just like he has with other guys? Would he have actually done that here or not? Plus, it also sets up nicely for whoever's next in line for when he gets to that spot again, but this time there's no bloodline or whatever we want to go. Let's say it's Gunter versus Sami Zayn at WrestleMania and there's uh, no impairment at ringside to cost him anything. You can do this in the sacred nature of the ring kind of stuff where at the biggest show at WrestleMania, there will be no interference level or any, something like that. So it's co- so it'd be different of what happens when Gunter is in that spot against somebody like that where there is no bloodline that's going to interfere. I like, I like it. I like what it sets up for everybody. <laughs> it's really good stuff. And of course, Gunter just doesn't have a bad match. So obviously, as a match, as a chest chopping battle, <laughs> it was obviously great as well. But this just does feed into the show that opened, the match that opened the show. Drew McIntyre versus Cody Rhodes, which was the first time the Bloodline interfered. Uh, one little note as well was it was a telly match that got a promo video beforehand. Yet another thing showcasing how much The Don Is Dead is improving the production of this show. And a decent telly bout it was. Cody is so incredibly over. The match gave him plenty of time for an opening telly bout. Uh, in the end, Cody on top after a mighty Cody cutter from the top rope. Drew kicking out, but that igniting the Bloodline interference. Jimmy Uso charging down but it was a distraction for Solo to spike Cody and set McIntyre up to the Claymore for the win. Something that is exactly the same again on purpose. (laughs) The reason that really hit me was, uh, I've said before, if you try to figure out what what stories that they are telling, just listen to the commentary. It's not subtle, (laughs) really. Like often, Triple H has added in a bit more subtlety and purposely the commentary will sometimes not comment on the thing that's happened. But if you want to just know definitely what the story is, and here, after the match, Michael Cole was playing the note so hard that McIntyre was a hypocrite for winning off of a bloodline interference, which I really, really liked. And the other note that it plays is this is Cody losing because of a bloodline interference in the exact same way that he did at WrestleMania. Beat for beat, almost exactly the same, the way that the interference plays out. And (laughs) it's like that is entirely done on purpose. Just a lesson to Cody. If you do the exact same thing you did last year, you will lose. You need to do something different. And that was reinforced where after the ad break, Cody's in the Doctors and Seth Rollins comes in to uh, check on him as well. Setting up Cody and the Avengers. (laughs) Cody and friends as our hero learns it's okay to lean on friendship in difficult times. I feel like this is exactly what this is all setting up. Where to defeat the bloodline, he's going to get every single person that the bloodline has wronged onto his side. This match also sets up Drew McIntyre as not being involved in that just because they have him so dead set on his path to becoming world champion that he's perfectly fine with now using that bloodline interference to get him momentum. Because it doesn't benefit him, he's not going to be interfering. And this set up that really well. Showing him actively having that character switch in this match was kind of huge for the next step where where Cody will try and get the Avengers together. I'm assuming obviously that will include like Seth Rollins, Sami Zayn. Kevin Owens is on the other show, but you can use him. There's obviously everybody else that Roman has screwed over time that you can use within this feud. But obviously for Cody to do that, I feel like in a Vince world, he would have just said it and then done it. (laughs) Whilst here, this is on television, in world, they've given you a reason for Cody to make that jump, to make that decision of, of, okay, I need to actually lean on these people who want to help me. And the most natural thing to do that is the Seth Rollins character, kind of those two leaning on each other. Purely because of what's happened so far with them teaming up to then face Rock and Roman on night one WrestleMania possibly, is that can also be used as him leaning on the friendship to help take on the bloodline for the title as well. And that was again reinforced for Jay in the main event. <laughs> so we didn't just feel it in Cody in the Cody world. And these people, oh, I didn't say Jay Uso in the people that could <laughs> uh, band together. 
that they they all need to band together to take these guys down. But that that lesson needs to be taught to them first. Otherwise, it just doesn't feel quite natural and quite right, which you probably would do in a Vince era. <laughs> well, so this is actively ahead of time being like, no, no, we're going to show you why they decide to band together before they do. Also, throughout the show, there was the Last Chance Battle Royal Women's Elimination Chamber final spot. Uh, stuff of note, Raquel Rodriguez returned. Lopez and Vega continued their legado LWO feud. Ivy Nile got to eliminate Natalia and then rain fire before getting eliminated by Baszler and Stark. The final four were Mia Yim, Raquel Gonzalez, Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark. Meechin out for Raquel to fight the two-on-one odds. Except Chelsea Green was never eliminated. And now she's eliminated. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I wasn't sure if I wanted... Uh, Chelsea Green do comedy spots in the Elimination Chamber or have Rodriguez make this big return because she can, she can feel like a certain big deal in this match and that's kind of a character motivation. If I have just returned, I'm going to make a statement in the Chamber. Like I'm not a massive fan of, of the competitors in a match all one at a time coming out and speaking their mind. Like Stratton got the much needed mic time. Uh, the different dynamics of the match were set up before each individual characters and their motivations but I've always found that having your characters come out and just speak their motivations to be, you know, the most boring way of doing it. <laughs> like, as much as I've just praised the Cody Rhodes and the Bloodline stuff, part of that is just because you're shown visually the reasons for those characters to have said motivations rather than the character coming out and just speaking them. This segment is characters coming out and speaking the motivations. It's like, ah, oh, it's the most boring way to do it. However, what it did do is set up all the different dynamics for the match, which is something that the men's chamber is desperately kind of lacking. You've got Drew McIntyre, but there isn't really anyone else. There's quite a few in there, I guess, like LA Knight and maybe Kevin Owens, where it's just like, well, it's a title to go for, so why not? Whilst Drew McIntyre is a character with his motivation so clearly stated and set, <laughs> he feels like he stands out in that match. Whilst for the women's one, they pretty much gave everybody their own different dynamic for it. But yeah, I just find it to be there, like a little awkward walkout, one at a time promo segment. Like, I've always disliked the structure, but this did the job well enough? Question mark? <laughs> well, other things of note, a Truth got an R Truth chant after his silly little interview, and no, it wasn't piped in. <laughs> what is this craziness? Also, there was the UFC challenge made on Raw. Like, I don't watch MMA, didn't know where that wanker was. <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not at WrestleMania, and hopefully it is just a product integration thing with, with Under Endeavor showing us you know, what it is. It's the future. That segment was the integration between WWE and UFC, both Under Endeavor. That is the future. <laughs> but you know what? Three-hour shows need time to fill. <laughs> anyway, that was the end of Monday Night Raw Live from Anaheim. I thought it was a really fun show, but the Raw's been in a little thing of you don't necessarily need to watch the shows for the next week to all about. However, I feel like this week the in-ring competition was solid enough that you're going to get an amazing time. I've not even talked about Chad Gable versus IFAR, which I'm massively impressed as well. A sign of it is the crowd that not really responding once they both walk out, and then they're going crazy for Gable by the end of it. Uh, but yeah, it was a, 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 general, a show that absolutely flew by, given that I sometimes struggle with the uh, balls. Uh, there's all, there is always that problem of the, of the third hour, just momentum-wise being so difficult to keep up, and more often than not, they don't succeed. However, here... They had the massive IC title match, and that really helps. <laughs> it just massively boosted it up. And with that, we move on down back to NXT, where yeah, there was a there was a thing that happened this week on NXT. There's a little thing, just a little thing to talk about. So let's move on down to NXT. Say hello to the kids. Big splash off the top. Is this going to be enough to retain the NXT Women's wow. Championship? Valkyria overcomes the odds. All was going so well. The NXT Women's Championship main event between Shotzi and Lyra Valkyria all was going perfectly until a DDT to the apron resulted in Shotzi being injured and out for nine months. <laughs> it was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that kind of sucks and suddenly your main event's completely shaken up. Yeah, obviously, shout out to Shotzi to get better, but she wasn't even the one taking the DDT, which makes it an even more like, oh, that sucks, kind of injury off of almost nothing, which is also why she wasn't on SmackDown with the, this NXT show being recorded. It then meant that we got Shotzi not on her Elimination Chamber qualifying match on SmackDown, but then she's wrestling in the main event here. It's like, yep, this was recorded, she got injured, and she's out for nine months. So, uh. Shotzi just hopped down off the apron, Then I was then in the picture-in-picture picture just holding her knee the entire time, and because it was picture-in-picture, picture, we got to see everything, where she's like taken to the back, unable to put any weight on her leg, then Lara just standing in the ring, 
as the new idea is just scrambled together backstage. Good thing this episode was recorded. So there was a, for me, quite clear edit in the uh, Lash Legend match earlier in the show. So they obviously did do some editing in it. And you know what, for NXT, which is half developmental, half TV show, like, that is perfectly fine to be in an edited state. I'm absolutely fine with that. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that at all. Obviously, some of the edits, quite funny. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, yeah. But yeah, oh, absolutely sucks. So uh, in the main event as well, to get such an injury, it takes you out for nine, for possibly nine months. So almost nothing in the way that it happened. <laughs> so, so strange. Anyway, the scramble together idea was an open challenge. So that at least the show had a main event. And out came Lash Legend. She, Legend had defeated Kalani Jordan like one segment earlier. So yeah, she was still in her gear. She was backstage and grand to go. And credit to them for this completely improvised ending to the show. Not the end of the world for Lash, for Lash Legend to get... Ending up getting a showcase like this too. Big splash off the top rope for the win, Val for Akira. Obviously the match isn't like a lot to sing about, but you got Legend accidentally getting like a huge elevation match and showing her in this spotlight. With the absolute unfortunate, huge unfortunate thing with Shotzi, you did get the uh, swing of Lash Legend getting this awesome little moment for herself. So... Yes, <laughs> a thing to get better, better for Shotzi, but it's so innocuous. <laughs> it's so unfortunate. The show opened up with the NXT North American Championship. Oberfemi versus Lexus King. No entrances like we're on Rampage. <laughs> the champion with it versus the challenger actively without. <laughs> Over in under five minutes. Powerbomb down. And uh, Lexus King was distracted by uh, X Division champion Robbie E. <laughs> and uh, King just destroying him rightfully after the distraction. It kind of took me by surprise that the match was so short, but then also I was like, yeah, I didn't want it to be longer. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Our new NXT Tag Team Champions got their celebration, which was interrupted by Chase U, and, oh God, <laughs> like this was what I was talking about, where some of the edits, not as good as others. So there was a badly mixed cheer when Andre Chase said, this is a cheerable moment. Right after the actual crowd were giving us a Chase You Sucks cheer with them so behind the wolf dogs, they then put in a woo, yay, like loud cheer for Chase You, and then they edited it back down. It's like, ah, it's not the worst mix I've seen from WWE, but it's pretty bad. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Well, I can actively see them not cheering. <laughs> I can actively see it. And then they, they inserted it with a bad mix. Uh, Fraser and Axiom were out next. Still makes me laugh that they have Axiom presented like every other lad in these segments in spite of being dressed like a lucha superhero. <laughs> just have him cut out, come out and just be like, well, yeah, I'm going to get in that ring and we're going to show you why we're the best. It's like, what? why have you got him be being so regular and normal? <laughs> Even in the backstage segments, Fraser and Acting would talk together and the, their segments talking to each other would be of the very same, exact same way as it would be two other characters. It's like, it's so strange. <laughs> They've obviously got him doing the different entrance, but aside from that, he's presented as such a, as a, like he's just normal, which is really strange. <laughs> it's really strange. Surely, surely you want to frame this guy as being like fitting of that kind of superhero visual that he gives, but instead he's presented and produced just like every other normal lad. <laughs> it's so strange. I <laughs> don't get it. Later in the show, we also got Chase U versus the Flying Lads. Don't know what the name is called, because that's what they're called. Chase winning after a succession of near falls. But the bigger story was, this, was that this whole thing was setting up the Good Brothers turning up in NXT. These young startups, <laughs> Gallows and Anderson, <laughs> attacking everybody. And hey, hey, it's something for them to do, isn't it? It's something for them to do, isn't it? <laughs> so they cut a, a promo later on in the show as well. And I wouldn't say they looked massively enthused or whatever, but, you know, they're there. They're, I mean, they're bringing so much experience down to NXT. Obviously, I don't know how they feel about being on NXT. Do they feel like it's a bit of a demotion or whatever? But they weren't doing anything on SmackDown. And now that they're not with AJ Styles, like, this felt like it was... So I understand the idea for AJ Styles. Like, to move on, he kind of does have to move past the Bullet Club and the club. Like, the era of that has moved on. But it does feel strange that AJ uh, AJ does that and they're immediately back down. Like they weren't being used at all <laughs> before AJ came back. And uh, they would they'd walk out with me a year now who's getting a good stride. But yeah, why, why not send him down to NXT? There's a lot more of a link now between NXT and the main roster. It's not the away lands where the guy running the main roster doesn't know what it is anymore. Like they're properly linked. You've got people, you've got something like Bron Baker where he's got his stuff on SmackDown. But he's also the NXT Tag Team Champion. So he's appearing on both shows at the same time. Like sometimes you get a Tiffany Stratton where she's taken up immediately. 
But the fact there is that link where you are getting the both talent, you are getting talent across both shows. But yeah, also uh, Ariana Grace continues to be great, even if she is in her loser to the stars phase of her NXT run. I feel like she's doing such good work, <laughs> and the uh, the cape she came out with, where she's almost like a, uh, she's almost like almost like an award statue <laughs> in herself. I, uh, yes. Everything about this character is working for me. I absolutely love it. And that is the end of the NXT review. There wasn't really a lot to talk about. It wasn't a show that had a lot going for it, but it did have the championship matches bookended and the unfortunate injury to Shotzi. So, ah, that sucks. And that is the week of WWE. A week that started with the Rock and Roman Reigns and ended with an improvised main event for the Young Uns. Of course, Monday Night Raw is what is quite a lot to talk about. It feels like it's doing a pretty good job of amping up Elimination Chamber, which is what I'll be starting the show with this time next week. So this time next week, we will know <laughs> what on earth is going on from the Raw side. We already know with the SmackDown side kind of what the buildings do, but here, we finally get it decided. Oh, also a massive shout out to uh, the Bailey segments and stuff. They're doing really well with damage control and building that up. Uh, this week was a bit more low-key, just because they've had two big weeks back-to-back. And this was, it was kind of time for just other people to have their breathing room. you got time. you got time to build to uh, April. you got a full month. <laughs> so we're going to see it again. It's absolutely fine. I mean, there's no rock and roll when you've got time to fill next week. Bailey can maybe main event next week because the Chamber stuff is raw uh, sided anyway. With that, I say thank you for listening, liking, engaging in any form, any manner. Always appreciate it. Never take it for granted. I'll be back next week to talk about the Chamber, Raw, and NXT. If I feel like talking about NXT, sometimes I have pay-per-views. I just let the pay-per-views flow out and <laughs> take the time up. And with that, I bid you adieu. Adios. <laughs>